Welcome, everybody. Brother Dan Goodwin here, your host on the Prosty News program, and I am excited. Boy, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I love coming into the studio, and I love coming into your living room or your, your car or wherever it is you watch the program, and I hope that you're enjoying these. And uh, uh, Boy, if you're enjoying this half as much as I enjoy doing it, then you're a happy, you're a happy sailor out there. And uh, but I'm going to we've got a, a topic of discussion today that's a little a little different because uh, uh, I think uh, we tend to look at the uh, the glamour stuff. We tend to look at the the glamorous, exciting things like Israel's back in the land and the uh, Jared Kushner and the peace agreement that's possibly being worked on. And uh, there's just the, all the, the nuclear warfare and the fact that uh, we're getting close to the World War three and. We look at these big, big things, and we tend, to, we tend to dwell on those. But you know what? There's some other prophecies in the Bible uh, that I think uh, need to be looked at. In my book, Seven Clocks Are Ticking, that I have right here, and uh, I have uh, seven clocks that I talk about. Those seven clocks, uh, some of them are very exciting. There's the nuclear clock. I mean, who, that's an exciting chapter, very scary chapter, by the way. I think we did a program about that here recently, the nuclear, the nuclear age that we live in. I gave the whole history of war from Genesis to, to where we are. And I, from, from Cain, the first war, Cain killing his brother with a stick or a rock, we've come a long way since then. We've learned, uh, we have developed this art of warfare and killing our brothers and and uh, I mean, now, now you can sit in an office building somewhere 10,000 miles away and kill somebody with the pressing of a button or a phone call. Uh, I mean, the world today could destroy itself tenfold. See what, I'm getting, see what I mean? These are exciting topics, and uh, we tend to talk about those topics, but I think there's some other topics that need to be hit. And uh, we had the seven of the seven clocks. I think the one that's probably talked about the least is the one we're going to talk about today, and that's the harvest ticking clock. The harvest time is a ticking clock, but uh, very few people talk about that one, and I'm not sure very many people even understand this one. Uh, let me read you a little paragraph here. This is right out of the book. The winds are blowing. The leaves are changing. And there is a chill in the air as autumn fast approaches don't that sound good to you i love fall i love the fall season you can see yourself out on your porch in a rocking chair and all of a sudden the leaves are blowing by the wind is blowing the leaves have turned and the beautiful colors and can you picture that in your mind today um, there is a great harvest coming and it will be huge i'm not referring to the changes and transitions that occur from summer to fall seasons I am speaking about the rapture of the church on God's prophetic calendar because the rapture is a harvest of souls. The signs of the coming of the end times are all around us. A person would have to be blind not to see them. Just as we can see the leaves changing color in the trees and the cool wind that comes, we can sense the end times are upon us. Paul did say that that day shall not overtake you as a thief, did he not? He certainly did. Just as a farmer knows the harvest is ready, so too a student of prophecy can sense the timing of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the harvest is a type of the rapture, which is a part of the threefold bodily resurrection that is fast approaching. It is a ticking clock that is near midnight. The storm clouds can be seen on the horizon and the frigid cold front is moving in and it's time for the crops to be gathered into the barn. Now let me make a statement here. Don't miss this. Let me make a statement right here and then I'm going to read a couple passages in the Bible. Don't miss this. A farmer may not know the day or the hour of the harvest. But he certainly knows the season. Is that true? He drives by in his tractor and he looks at the field on the left and he looks at the field on the right, the corn and the beans and whatever crops he has. He says, boy, it's getting close. Boy, that corn's almost ready. But he doesn't know the day or the hour. But he can certainly see the signs, can he? He can see the tassels on the corn. He can see how tall they are. He can pull back the leaves on the corn stalks. And he can look at the, at the kernels on the corn cob. Hey, how many, how many are getting hungry right now? 
There's nothing like fresh corn on the cob. Man, I love it. But that farmer, he, he doesn't know the day or the hour, but he, he can look and see that it's almost here. The harvest is almost ready. And uh, listen, I believe there's a biblical harvest coming. And I believe there's some things in the Bible that talk about the harvest. And I believe there's some things in the Bible that we miss because we're not farmers today. Now, some of you out there are. When I preach at churches, I'll always ask, how many, have, how many are farmers out there? How many have ever had a farm or a garden? And uh, it seems like there's very few hands that go up. And the hands that do go up are old, gray-headed people. Now, I'm not old, gray-headed. This is, this is grease and gray form that comes in a can for evangelists. And I tell people, because uh, uh, evangelists have got to look old, right? So I, uh, you know, I spray my hair with this grease and gray formula. And I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, but, uh, but the old gray-headed people out there, they, they grew up farming. Or, the, or maybe when they was a child, their, their dad had a farm because people farmed back then. In Bible days, everybody had farms. You didn't have Walmart to go buy your food. You, you, went to, you could go to the market and you could trade for things, but you, you generally had crops and, uh, and animals and livestock and things uh, because that's how you survive. In fact, uh, the nation of Israel, everything in Israel revolved around the harvest. Did you know the seven feasts that we talk about so often in Leviticus 23, the seven feasts? Did you know those seven feasts revolve around the, the harvest? Did you know there's three main harvests that the seven feasts all re revolve around? Did you know that the three times that all the Jewish men, according to Deuteronomy, all the Jewish men, 18 and older, had to be in Jerusalem on three times? Do you know the first time was Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the evening Passover ends. Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. All the men had to be there. Did you know that that's the barley harvest? <laughs> Did you know that Pentecost, 49, 59 days lay after first fruits? Uh, did you know that that's, that's the wheat harvest? And did you know that all the men had to be in Jerusalem that day? Acts chapter 2. That's why those men were there when Peter preached. He had a captive audience. They were there because they had to be there. Um, so, And the third time, of course, uh, during tabernacles in the fall, the fruit harvest. You, you had to be there for that. These were high Sabbath days. Unleavened bread was a Sabbath day. Not Saturday, but a Sabbath day. And a lot of the confusion about Good Friday comes because of a misunderstanding. They took them off the cross because uh, the Sabbath was coming. People jumped to the conclusion, oh, it must have been Friday because the Sabbath is coming. No, he's not talking about the Saturday Sabbath. He's talking about Feast of Unleavened Bread that happens at 6 p.m. that night. Uh, they had to get them off the cross before that, and they did. 3 p.m. Uh, they came, and Jesus had died. And uh, they broke the legs of the other two. So... The harvest is so important to understand your Bible, and it's so important to understand the end times. The harvest has a lot to teach us uh, about these things. So let's, let's jump into some of this here uh, and explain. Now, before I go any further, let me tell you that what I'm talking about is, the, is in a chapter called The Harvest is a Ticking Clock, and it's in the book, The Seven Clocks Are Ticking. Many of you may have the book already, and that's okay, but, uh, but I think it's a chapter that uh, people kind of, skim through fast to get to the what they think is the good stuff this is good stuff and this is important stuff and we need to understand this um if uh we're also going to talk about the barley harvest um now that is also in the chapter of the seven clocks ticking book but i also wrote a whole an entire book just on the barley harvest in detail it's not a big book it's a uh, hundred and something pages 110 pages uh, but it's an exciting book, and it's, it's one of those things that the Lord gave me that I think will help you. When I learned about a bib, the word a bib, and the, uh, you know, Christ said uh, he's going uh, to take you out of Egypt in the month of bib. And when I began to understand that, boy, it opened up a lot of things for me prophecy-wise. And, um, and I believe I, you know, that God gave me this, and I believe I've helped a lot of people with it. So, and I'm sure Prophecy News, you can go to the website on the screen there. You can get uh, either book. By the way, the, the Barley Harvest book comes with a two-CD set of my radio program, my God's Final Jubilee program. Uh, there's like four, four programs on two discs that, that you'll enjoy. It's audio that you put in your CD player. And I go, I go through the seven feasts and the Jubilee and all. I get all the way to the Barley Harvest, and I explain all that in great detail. It's like two hours long. So... Um, so you can order the, the set or you can order one or the other. 
So let me, let me, let me share some of this with you and try to help you with the, the harvest and why it's so important. But boy, did you get that? A farmer, he knows the harvest is near, but he doesn't know the day or the hour. My friend, I know that Jesus, the return of Jesus is near. Even though I don't know the day or the hour, I know that it's near. How do I know that? I'm looking at the harvest. I'm looking. I'm paying attention. And uh, so let, let's get into it. The harvest is a threefold thing. There is so many, so many things in the scriptures about the harvest and the harvesting of crops. There are parables in the Bible. In fact, let me read you a couple passages here. In Jeremiah chapter 8, real quick, verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Uh, you can get a concordance and look at all the places the word harvest is used in the Bible. You'll be shocked, hundreds of them. Uh, I mean, harvest is all through the Bible. I mean, that's how they lived. Everything revolved around the harvesting of the crop. The whole book of Ruth is, is about the harvesting of the barley. Did you know that Ruth, uh, when uh, she, she gleaned in Boaz's field during the barley harvest, which is Passover time, all the way 49 days later to Pentecost, which is the wheat harvest, she gleaned barley and wheat in Boaz's garden. You see, when you understand the, the different harvest and when they took place, how it opens up more understanding of the scriptures. How, you know, how many times have you read the book of Ruth and didn't understand that the barley harvest meant it was around Passover time? How many of you realize when, when it talks about gleaning wheat, that's Pentecost time. That's in the, in the midsummer time, right? And of course, when they're talking about grapes and the fruit harvest and all that, that's fall. So the Bible is going to open up some more to you when you understand some of these things. Um, of course, uh, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. I hope that you're saved, friend, because there's a harvest coming. I believe the rapture is a harvest. I believe it's a harvest of the souls of men and the bodies of men because uh, the rapture is really a bodily resurrection is what that is. The saints in heaven today are there with a glory. They, they have a body, but it's not the body that they're going to have. Their, uh, their body is in the ground. And one of these days at the rapture, the body's coming out of the ground, going to be resurrected. Uh, see, Christ is the first fruits. He rose bodily. He's the only one to have risen bodily. He's the first fruits. And uh, there's coming a time when, uh, when a, a, a harvest is coming. Let me read another verse for you in Matthew 13. Of course, Matthew 13 is the, the wonderful story of the sower and the seed, the four types of soil, the, the, the good ground and the ground with the rock, the stony ground, the thorny ground. Remember all that? Uh, and uh, the thorns and the, the stony places. And, and uh, so at the end of this passage, this is the, whole, the whole chapter seems to be talking about harvesting and the rapture and all that. Uh, verse, verse 30 here, chapter 13, verse 30, he says, let, uh, let both grow, grow together until the harvest. Uh, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and, and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Um, look at verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. Without going into great detail on this passage, get this. The, the end time is, a har is likened unto a harvest. And uh, so there's something to be learned from harvesting that will help you understand the end time events and help you understand that the harvest is a ticking clock pointing towards midnight. We're almost there. Look, you can look out. You can see the harvest is almost ready. The, the core of Israel is just about ready. Okay, so let's go a little further. Um, many people don't grow up on farms, so our generation has very little understanding of, of, of this. But let me say this. There's two resurrections that you need to understand, need to be aware of, two resurrections. The first resurrection is, uh, is uh, the second death had no power. Of the, so there's two resurrections. The first resurrection is the, um, the resurrection of the saved, and it's in three stages. The second resurrection is the great white throne at the end of the kingdom age. That's where all the lost people are resurrected. They're, uh, they're, they're judged according to things written in the books. Their name's not in the book of life, and they're cast in the lake of fire. You don't want to be standing at that one, friend. Uh, the first resurrection, though, this is interesting. It's in three stages, um, and we're going to talk about that. When a believer died before the cross, his body went in the ground, his soul and spirit went to Abraham's bosom. This is in the Old Testament now, Luke 16. This is a place called paradise that Christ promised to the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43. 
which many misunderstand today. G uh, Jesus went to paradise when he died on the cross. Uh, by the way, his spirit, he's a threefold being. His spirit went to the Father. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. His body was placed in uh, uh, Joseph's tomb. And his soul went to Abraham's bosom, paradise. And he's going to lead all the Old Testament saints, David and Saul and uh, all the Old Testament people who had died in the Lord, uh, are awaiting the redemption of his blood being placed on the mercy seat. And then they're going to be they're going to leave paradise and they're going to go to heaven, which they do. He leads captivity captive, gives gifts on the men. I think, I think it's Colossians chapter one <clears throat> and uh, takes them to heaven. So man is a threefold being. And uh, he uh, uh, body, soul and spirit, spirit, soul and body. First Thessalonians chapter five, the very God of peace, sanctify you holy. I pray God, your whole your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. So man is a threefold being spirit, soul and body. Now, today, after the cross, when you die, your your soul and spirit doesn't go to paradise. It goes to heaven. Because Paul said to be absent from the body is, is to be present with the Lord. That was not true in Moses' day. That was not true in David's day. David and Moses went to a place called paradise. Uh, now, it's a good place. And you can read about it in Luke 16. Uh, but when you and I die today in the New Testament, we go, our body and soul doesn't go to paradise. It goes to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You see, in the, in the Old Testament, before the blood is placed on the mercy seat in heaven, the Bible says in the flesh can no man see God. You cannot go, you cannot be in the presence of God in the flesh uh, without your regenerated spirit, your born again experience. All right. So uh, you can't, that's why Moses wanted to see God and God said, I'll put up my hand. I'll let you see my hinder parts. You know, interesting there. You know, if you've ever seen the, the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, remember years ago, and they got a lot of things wrong in that movie, but one thing they got right was, remember when they opened that ark and God's presence is in there? Remember, what, remember he hides because he knows what's going to happen. He hides and he doesn't look upon it. They got that part right. You cannot, in the flesh, unregenerate man cannot look upon God and live. And that's a Bible principle way back in the Old Testament. And uh, now when we get born again, now you can have that present you can be in god's presence but see our body has not yet been born again our body's not been redeemed yet that's what the rapture is all about the rapture is is gonna it's going to redeem the bodies of all those who have died in the lord and their body's going to be resurrected and going to be with the lord and that's why the bible says uh, the dead in christ shall rise first then which were alive remain shall be caught up uh, because we hadn't died yet, we go threefold, spirit, soul, and body. We go all at once. But the people who have already died, their spirit, soul is in heaven, but their body's in the ground down here. They're going to be rejoined with the glorified body in heaven. So, uh, interesting. See, what does all this have to do with farming? It has a lot to do with farming, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that with you. Um, let's see, I got that already. Let me... Um, when Christ paid the penalty for sin, he rose from the grave. He became the first fruits unto God. Remember, a harvest is, is threefold, right? Uh, a harvest is a threefold event. Um, first fruits, main harvest, and the gleanings. In other words, in Bible days, when you, when you harvested your crop, you first got the first fruits of your garden, and that was given to God. And that, of course, the barley harvest uh, the first fruits of the barley, that's what was waved on the Feast of First Fruits. Which, by the way, that's why the barley has to be ready before there can be a Passover. Because after Passover, three, three days after Passover, they had to celebrate the Feast of First Fruits, which is the day that Christ rose from the grave. On Feast of First Fruits, they were to wave a sheaf of barley. If there's no barley, how do you, how do you wave the barley? You don't. <laughs> That's why there has to be barley. And I got a little saying in the book. Uh, no barley, no abib. No abib, no Passover. If the barley is not ripe, what the priests would do, the Levites would do in Bible days, they would look at the barley on that last day of the, of the month of Adar, right before the, 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 the new moon, they would look at the harvest. If it wasn't ready, if it wasn't a bib, if it wasn't almost ready for harvest, they would add a leap month, a whole month. And by the way, since there's only 354 days on the Jewish calendar, guess what? About every three years, you're a whole month off. And 
you would automatically add that month in because the harvest is off. And so you see how the barley harvest is a reset button for the Jewish calendar? Uh, that leap month. Now, they don't do it this way anymore. That's why you can't trust the Hebrew calendar. They don't, they don't celebrate this anymore. They, there's nobody checking the barley. It's all done commu computerized. And by the way, ever since the dispersion way back in 70 A.D., they came up with another system to determine Passover. It's all mathematically done. That is not biblical. That's why you can't trust our calendar and you can't trust their calendar. You just better sit back and wait on God and watch what's going on because you're not going to figure this out with anybody's calendar. And uh, by the way, the, um, these other calendars that they, they've come up with uh, they, that they claim are the right biblical calendars, there is no right biblical calendar because there's no system of determining a bib in Israel. To determine a bib means that you look at the barley and determine that it's almost ready. It's got to be within 6 to 11 days of being ready to harvest. If it is, they declare a bib, which means the next day is day one on, of the month of bib, or we call it Nissan. That's Passover month, and two weeks later, it's Passover. If the barley's not a bib, they add a leap month, and everything's backed up a whole month. Talk about not knowing the day of the hour. How are you ever going to know this in advance? You can't know until the priest determines a bib. You can't know when Passover is. And therefore, you can't know when the Feast of Pentecost is or the Feast of Trumpets or any of the other feasts because they're all subject to the determining of a bib. All right, see, that, that's how important the harvest is. The harvest in Bible days was in three stages. You, you would go out and you would harvest the first fruits and give them to the Lord. Then you would have your main harvest. That's where you'd cut most of the field. But you were to leave the corners of the field. And you weren't to cut everything. You were to leave something behind for what? For the poor and for the widows. And see, it's God's welfare system, a pretty good system, by the way, whereby you had to work to get some food. It wasn't delivered to your doorstep while you're sitting there drinking a Coke, watching a soap opera on TV. You, the widows had to go out in the field and work, and the poor had to go out and work. By the way, that's a good system. We could learn from that. <laughs> uh, you, you just give somebody money to sit home, you're not helping that person. And he'll never get off that system once he gets on it. And my goodness, people make more in welfare than they do working a job. Well, what, what, what a crazy system is this? Um, so um, so we got the three, the, the three stages to a harvest. But there's also three harvests. And let me, let me move on a little quicker here. There, there are not only is there three stages to the harvest, first fruits, main harvest, gleanings. By the way, the first fruits is Christ. Christ is the first to bodily rise from the grave. What's the main harvest? It's the rapture. The rapture is the harvest of all the bodies of those who have died, the saints. That's the main harvest, likened unto a harvest of a field. So what's the gleanings? The gleanings is those who will be saved during the tribulation those, uh, those, those, the gleanings of those people you see in Matthew 24 that everybody gets so confused about. Everybody goes to Matthew 24 and becomes either mid-trib or post-trib because they don't understand what they're reading. They're reading in Matthew 24 uh, what's happening during the tribulation. <laughs> they're reading about, uh, we're not even here. They're reading about Israel. When it says, woe unto her who is with child in those days, he, he's not talking about somebody in Chicago. He's not talking about a gen he's talking about a Jewish woman in Israel who's who has to run for her life because the Antichrist has entered the temple and he's uh, broke the peace treaty. The two witnesses have been killed. They've ascended back to heaven. The 144,000 just became believers. They trusted in Messiah and they're running for their lives because the Antichrist is going to kill them. And that's where Matthew 24 comes along. Woe unto him, who, if, if you're in the field, don't go back to the house. Run for your life. If you're on the rooftop, don't even go in the house. Don't go in to get your cell phone. Run for your life. You've got minutes to get away because the Antichrist is going to seek to kill you. That's during the tribulation. But, uh, but you'll see a rapture in Matthew 24. It's not the pre-trib rapture that we're, that we're in. It's the gleanings. It, see how an understanding of farming could change your understanding of the Bible and help you with your Bible, help you with prophecy? The gleanings is another rapture. When Christ comes on the white horse, there's going to be another rapture of, of the gleanings, and they're going to join us on the white horses, and we're going to come down and end the battle of Armageddon just like that, and Christ is going to set up the kingdom. So 
There are, but there are three harvests as well, three stages to a harvest, but there were three main harvests in Israel, and I think I've already shared this with you. The barley harvest took place during Passover, and that's the reset to the calendar every year, or at least it was in Bible days. That's why you can't know the day or the hour because you don't know when the barley's a bib. You got the barley harvest, you got the wheat harvest at Pentecost, and you got the fruit harvest in the fall, right? So, so what's the significance of this? The barley harvest is the reset to all of it. Now, what does the, if the barley is a bib, it becomes Passover month. If the bar, barley is not a bib or not ripe, not ready for harvest in 6 to 11 days, the Levites would declare pa, uh, leap, leap month, and it would be backed up. So what's the significance of this? The significance of this is that what does barley represent? It represents the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel. How do we know that? The story of Gideon. I won't read the story, but in the story of Gideon, you remember uh, down in the tent, the Midianite has a dream. He tells his partner in the tent about the dream. Uh, he says, in my dream, a cake of barley rolled down the hill and ran over my tent, flattened it. And the, his, his friend said, that's none other than the sword of Gideon. And we're going to die tomorrow. I'm ad-libbing here, but we're going to die tomorrow. He was right. He understood something that many prophecy experts don't understand today. The barley is a type of Israel. The Midianite knew that. Now, what does that mean? That means barley represents Israel. So this thing about a bib, what is it all about? The bib barley, when the barley is ready, they announce a bib, and it resets their, their yearly calendar. How does that apply to us prophetically? If Israel is the barley, when Israel is a bib already, God hits the reset button and the end times begin. We see that in the feeding of the 5,000, don't we? Remember the, the 12 basket? Remember the, the lad has five loaves of barley, two fishes? Remember after they get done in, they fill 12 baskets with barley? There's no fish in the basket. Where's the fish? The fish is gone. The fish is the Christians. When the, tw and the lesson there is this. When the 12 tribes of Israel are ready, when they're a bib, when the 12 baskets are full of barley, when the barley is a bib, when Israel is a bib, when Israel is ripe, when Israel is ready for the end times, God will take the fish out, the, ch the church, and God will once again deal with the 12 tribes of Israel. Isn't that great? What a story. Now, I've, I've just brushed the surface of this. It's in the two books. The Barley Harvest book goes in great detail in it. It's also in the Seven Clocks Ticking book. Uh, get them there. Listen, are you ready for a bib? Are you ready for the trumpet to sound? Are you ready for the Lord to hit the reset button and say, okay, Israel is ready. I'm coming for my church. I'm taking my church home. Are you ready for that? I hope you are. Call the 800 number on your screen if you're not ready. If you'd like to get some more information about being saved, we'd love to help you with that. But until then, keep looking up.